Papua New Guinea is the kind of place most people have heard of but would struggle to find on the map. So why is it suddenly attracting a significant amount of geopolitical attention and high-profile visitors? Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Enda Brady. Papua New Guinea may seem an unlikely place to find itself at the centre of a showdown between global rivals. But this largely undeveloped island of 9 million people and over 800 languages is suddenly very popular. The reason? Because it lies on one of the political fault lines between East and West. The key to Papua New Guinea's new popularity is where it lies in the South Pacific, directly between China and Australia at the gateway to Asia, an area the US sees as its backyard. A tussle for influence has begun. When the nearby Solomon Islands recently signed a security pact with Beijing, Washington and others were stung into action. In the last few months, visitors have included French President Emmanuel Macron, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi and America's State and Defence Secretaries. President Joe Biden would have gone too if it wasn't for a last minute cancellation. The outcome was the US agreeing a defence deal with Papua New Guinea. In response, China is offering a free trade agreement. The island nation's Prime Minister has insisted his country remains neutral ground. But do the world's major nations agree? Well, let's meet our guests in Port Moresby. The capital of Papua New Guinea is David Lee. He's professor in political science at the University of Papua New Guinea. In Singapore, Samir Puri, visiting lecturer in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. In Brisbane, in Queensland, Australia, Tess Newton Kane, senior research fellow at Griffith Asia Institute. And here in the studio with me, Humphrey Hawksley, author and a former BBC correspondent. Welcome to Roundtable to all of you. Going to go to you first, David, in Papua New Guinea. I'm grateful for your time. You have fought power cuts and connectivity issues to join us. So first of all, David, I'm going to read to you a quote from a former diplomat, Winnie Kayap from PNG. We'll take a look at that quote now. And she says about all this interest in Papua New Guinea from China, from the US and elsewhere. She says, we are baffled. It's like watching two elephants playing on a patch of grass, and we are that patch. In the Second World War, we were in a war that had nothing to do with us. This is a repetition of that kind of thinking. Uh, David Lee, what do you make of that statement? Two elephants on a patch of grass, and you are that patch. Well, I think she's right. Uh, obviously, uh, interest in the South Pacific and Papua New Guinea it sort of receded after the Second World War. So, I mean, the place was virtually forgotten after that. And it has been, uh, obviously, America's and China's interest in the place that has sort of rekindled uh, the attention that uh, Papua New Guinea is receiving right now, which is quite amazing after this interregnum of uh, since the whatever 70 years since the first world war but uh, I guess you could see it as as two elephants um, I, I wouldn't say that living here one doesn't experience it in that way uh, there have been a lot of improvements especially around the apex um, summit in 2018 when uh, China uh, improved a lot of the infrastructure in Port Moresby. Um, that was very visible. America's presence less visible, but um, as you know, there's been a security agreement uh, recently signed with Anthony Blinken and, and uh, Obviously, things are changing there. This is it's getting this military attention now. Um, well, not primarily military, but it's. Uh, I think well, I think it is primarily military, actually, but it also includes uh, security issues with climate change and economic development. Um, 
So I'd say, I think she can see them as, uh, imagine them to be elephants. But I wouldn't say that uh, for ordinary people, it's uh, a constant overpowering reality. David, is it much of a talking that point? That would be my, my, my would. Is it much of a talking yeah. point amongst people? Is it much of a talking point there amongst people? You know, you've got China and America, France taking an interest. Is it much of a talking point for people in Papua New Guinea? Oh, to a certain extent, yes. I mean, um, I suppose that at the, say, the intellectual level, there's sovereignty issues with the American security um, agreement. Um, I, I don't think people analyze it closely and uh, whether or not they see the implications of this. I mean, there are opportunities, obviously. Uh, the opportunities are financial aid from both parties as they compete with one another. And um, also, notwithstanding, you have to think of Australia has been uh, the primary aid donor. Um, so their interest is also acute. Um, so I'd say there, there, there's more than <laughs> there are more than two elephants, I guess, for the uh, for the country. Now that, you, now that you mention Australia, I want to bring you in, Tess. How do people in Queensland, far north Queensland, looking north, your neighbours there, Papua New Guinea, what's the feeling like in Australia about China and America having this power play in the South, South Pacific? Uh, thank you. Yes, I am joining you from Queensland. I'm joining you from Mianjin, also known as Brisbane. Um, and I think that the position of Queensland in relation to the Pacific is quite particular, and especially in relation to Papua New Guinea. Um, here in Queensland, we have the largest number of Papua New Guineans living outside of Papua New Guinea, um, with a very strong diaspora, and it's even more so, mar markedly so, in the north, um, in the north of Queensland, up around Cairns. Australia is obviously very, um, very alert and very aware of what's going on in its near region. As David's already made reference to, Australia is a very significant partner for Papua New Guinea, not least as a former coloniser, the former coloniser or the former colonial power from whom Papua New Guinea um, achieved independence nearly 50 years ago. So the relationship with Australia is very strong. It's very deep. Um, it has a number of facets to it. Some of them are more controversial than others. It's a it's a relationship that you know has had peaks and troughs over time, and can have certain um, points pain points in it, um, particularly around things like visas and and access and movement between the two places. The Australian position in terms of uh, geostrategic competition in the region is um, quite alive to that, it's quite alive to that conversation. Certainly Australians beyond the foreign policy and national security community are possibly taking more of an interest in the region than has previously been the case. It's um, always been a bit of a paradox here in Australia as to how little awareness people have of places like Papua New Guinea. Vanuatu, Solomon Islands that are very close to the eastern seaboard of Australia. That seems to have changed. That's changing and has changed in the last few years. We're seeing more media coverage of what's going on in those regions, um, in those countries, I should say. There's more discussion of, of things like um, how those countries can take part in things that are happening here in Australia, whether it's by way of labour mobility or sport or people-to-people -people links. So it's definitely caused, it's definitely provided a driver for an increase in what I usually refer to as Pacific literacy on the part of Australians, which is a, a, a knowledge and understanding of their near neighbourhood. Samir, I want to ask you, the Prime Minister James Marape says Pacific nations will refuse to choose between the US and China, but he has already pretty much chosen, hasn't he? And he's chosen the United States. 
Yes, and in fact, in the three years I've been working in Singapore, I've seen quite a number of Pacific Southeast Asian and and South Pacific states maintaining this commitment to not having to choose and finding their options fo- foisted upon them to have to make some sort of decision. And the the thing that's really happened in uh, Papua New Guinea's neighbourhood is that the Solomon Islands, just a little bit to the east clearly made a choice a couple of years ago to sign a security pact with China, and that alarmed America, Australia, and the Western uh, countries to the extent that you've had that flurry of visits to Papua New Guinea. And it's culminated in, as we've described, this quite significant deal between Papua New Guinea and the USA around security assistance. I believe that the details of the pact they've signed indicate 15 or so years it will last for it will provide you know, U.S. military access to, I think, five or six sites on Papua New Guinea. Um, the U.S. Defense Department and the Defense uh, Secretary Lloyd Austin is at pains to say that the U.S. is not going to set up a permanent base, uh, military base in Papua New Guinea. But regardless, I think you know the point you make in your question is, is quite well made. It, it really is a case Papua New Guinea has chosen. But having said all of that, Papua New Guinea still has extensive economic relations with China. And uh, they don't want to choose between uh, this uh, you know, division of their sort of attention, security from America and Australia, and uh, trade and prosperity from China. I think that's the balance they'd like to strike and maintain. Humphrey, you've reported extensively from Papua New Guinea over the decades. Is this an opportunity for the country to have two superpowers interested and and get lots of investment in? Or is there a potential threat here down the line? I I think it's an opportunity for the whole of the the Oceania, the whole of the Pacific region, actually. I mean, the population of Papua New Guinea is about 10 million. It is, if you're talking in Cold War terms, it is in Australia's backyard, which means it is in America's backyard. And therefore, if you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and all that sort of thing, there are lines that, are, that, 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 that cannot be crossed. Now, during the Pacific War, which ended 78 years ago, the US drew up something called <clears throat> uh, War Plan Orange. And that was what would happen if a rising power, then Japan, was going to take the Pacific. And they pretty much followed that, apart from Hawaii and Hiroshima, that was pretty much followed. Uh, It's classified, but one can presume there is a similar plan in operation now of how to deal with the Pacific. And during the Cold War, the Pacific was known as the the American Lake. Uh, And if you look through there, you go beyond Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Fiji, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, all these places that we've we've talked about, these... uh, some as French sovereign territory, some are dependencies of America like Guam and Marshall Islands and things like this. You haven't really got a Chinese footprint on that. And if you're looking at the populations, which are not that big, but I mean, it's very strategic, you go to the Avril Marshall Islander or Papua New Guinea, and I'll be correct if it, if it, and they would much prefer to go to Disneyland than they would to go to Tiananmen Square on holiday. Uh, so America has got, uh, China, I'm sorry, has got a lot of catching up to do in forging alliances, in making friends, in bringing this region into its vision, because it's very much in a a Western uh, American vision, and nobody's going to build a huge base in Vanuatu or Papua New Guinea now. They've got these rights. It is significant. David, can I ask you, what are the main challenges facing Papua New Guinea right now? Would you say the people you speak to, students you mix with, what, what are the key priorities for them? Oh, most obviously, uh, development, infrastructure, um, law and order, and sec- uh, personal security, and not so much regional or international security. Or, um, yeah, I think they are, they are foremost in people's minds. I mean, if you look at Papua New Guinea, it has a GDP that's greater than uh, other Pacific nations, I mean, excluding Australia and New Zealand. But per capita, it lags behind Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. So there is, yeah, this idea that, you know, things have not 
reach the, the ordinary people in terms of uh, the resources that are being moved out of the country, um, the natural gas and the, the gold and silver that's coming out of the mines. So there, I think those are foremost in people's minds. So th this geopolitical uh, struggle that's going on now, obviously, between China and the U.S., is not something that's right foremost on the ordinary, with the ordinary person, obviously. Um, so I, w I would say that those are the issues that uh, really concern the country. And of course, there is political corruption often recurs as a theme that, uh, that people also point to. Can I just um, ask Samir, Samir, um, do, Samir, do people care where help comes from as long as it arrives? Depends on what you're being helped with. So there has been a provision in the US Papua New Guinea deal to mention things around maritime piracy and natural disasters as well. So one could feasibly imagine uh, if something goes wrong in either of those two spheres that we'd be looking at uh, you know, a non-war situation. But in terms of the sort of security side of it, something I think is really important to mention is, I mean, obviously the proximity to Australia, as we've talked about, in particular, uh, the Cape York Peninsula is somewhere which sort of juts out north of in Australia, just south of, of Papua New Guinea. The distance between the two is quite small. U.S. Marines have been exercising quite energetically along the Cape York Peninsula in, in recent weeks and months, as reported in, in uh, the U.S. press. And I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, illustrate uh, their reach and their ability to deploy in these sort of tropical island environments. And it's not necessarily the case that Papua New Guinea is, is going to be a theater of war. It's quite far away from where US-China tensions are at their, their most acute, which is, of course, around Taiwan. But it's really about Papua New Guinea's role as a sort of a staging ground uh, for possible US military actions further north in the Pacific. But I think in terms of where the help comes from, ultimately, Papua New Guinea will be looking for another part of the deal that they signed with America is assistance in building up their own quite uh, modest security forces uh, in the years to come. So that's something that Papua New Guinea will be expecting to receive security assistance, training, and that sort of military help from America. Tess, the Prime Minister James Marape has said that Papua New Guinea is a friend to all, an enemy to none. If they keep cozying up towards the United States, do you think China will see it that way? Well, just to pick up on a couple of things that we've heard from other people. Um, first of all, I don't I don't agree with this um, position that Papua New Guinea has made a choice and has chosen the US. Um, Papua New Guinea is a long-standing member of the non-aligned movement, just as other Pacific Island countries are, such as Fiji and Vanuatu. And as you say, Papua New Guinea's foreign policy is based around being friends to all and enemies to none. Um, Mr. Marape and other Pacific leaders are perfectly well aware of how countries such as the US and Australia and New Zealand and the UK have made plenty of money and done very well economically out of close relationships with China. And he, he, he quite rightly, that sees that that's an opportunity for his country as well. And we've already, as David's already mentioned, there's a very strong economic relationship between China and Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is also looking for opportunities such as education for its young people, particularly around technical areas, including green, uh, the green economy, renewable energy, and those sorts of things. Increasing numbers of students from Papua New Guinea are now studying at universities in China, whereas they may have you know, previously either not had an opportunity to study at all or may have studied somewhere else. So I think there's certainly scope for, and I think Marape has already made this very clear, as have other Pacific leaders, that they see themselves being able to work with a range of partners. They're very clear about what their own development priorities are. They're very clear about what their security concerns are. They're largely around human security and particularly the security challenges associated with climate change, which is on the record in the region as being the preeminent security concern. So I think it's really important that the rather than trying to um, distill everything down to some sort of binary choice, that we recognise that 
the leaders of these countries are working in very complex environments and that they are well aware of the complexity in which they work. And I would just also, uh, you know, take take some um, take you know a little bit of umbrage with use of terms like our backyard or it's Australia's backyard or America's backyard. Papua New Guinea isn't anybody's backyard. The Pacific isn't anybody's backyard. Uh, you know, the, the, what, one of the main things which has not yet been mentioned since 1945 is that these countries have gone from being colonial possessions to being independent countries. Yes, there are still some colonial possessions, but Papua New Guinea is an independent sovereign country. So there'll be no U.S. Marines, to, you know, trotting up from Cape York or anywhere else unless at the invitation and with the uh, permission of the Papua New Guinea government. Well, and on that, that point, that, meant, that, on that point, the case, even under the security agreement, and I think that that's something that really needs to be kind of stated fairly clearly that con these countries are individual sovereign countries. They exercise sovereign decisions, just as uh, other countries in the world, and that that needs to be the starting point for cons for these sorts of conversations. Well, let's see what the prime minister makes of this. We can hear now from James Marape himself. This is what he told reporters recently. And I want to give assurance to everyone here, including, uh, including our friends from Asia, that this is not about setting up for war. Rather, it's about setting up presence for nation building in Papua New Guinea and this part of our country, this part of, part, of, part of planet Earth and in the Pacific. Humphrey, that's the current prime minister, one of his predecessors, Peter O'Neill. He says that the US Papua New Guinea Defence Cooperation Agreement has painted a target on PNG's back. How would you feel about that? I think this is the two arguments we just heard from Tess about this backyard thing, which is, which is cited a lot in Washington when they're looking at strategic things, but is very different when you're on the ground in Papua New Guinea. I think what we're hearing from this discussion and from Papua New Guinea itself is that the cry from the global south that we are not going to be, you are with us or you're against us again. That is over, and that's a large learning curve to be learnt in Washington, and they're not quite with it yet. But with the Global South, and, and, and the other thing that's here is that the strong global institution, which has flown below the radar for a long time, is the United Nations General Assembly. And with the UN Security Council in paralysis, this body is getting more weight. It doesn't have any power, but it has influence and has sway. Papua New Guinea, Tuvalu, Nauru population 11,000, they all have one single vote in that. And if you look at the voting through that, because Tess was talking about individual sovereign states there, I mean, in Syria, in <coughs> the Rohingyas, uh, with uh, Crimea and Ukraine, these are massive votes that they have one way or another against Russia, against Syria, and when it comes to the Indian Ocean, where there's a territorial dispute between Mauritius and the Chagos Islands and Britain, Britain lost that vote by a huge majority. So this is becoming a voice. And I think that if either China or America wants to go into Papua New Guinea or the thing and says, right, now you're going to do our bidding, they are going to get not only the voice of Papua New Guinea saying, go away, they're going to get the Global South shouting them down. Just on that point, I'll come back to you, David, just finally. Is this all an incredible opportunity for Papua New Guinea or a very worrisome threat coming down the line? I would think um, um, in both cases, yeah, it is an opportunity. Um, Papua New Guinea can play China against the US and the US against China. Um, but of course, it is a, there is a threat and danger there. I want to ask Samir the same question. That's Samir, would you see this as uh, an incredible opportunity for a country like Papua New Guinea or a threat coming down the line? Well, I suppose it's the most attention it's received from uh, you know, the possibility of US uh, financial assistance, uh, as we've heard for several generations. But Tess's point about post-colonial legacy is really critical. And, the, and America and Australia are going to be very careful not to create any impression of superimposing their views over Papua New Guinea and to try to make it as beneficial to Papua New Guinea as, as it can be in terms of the deal and its reciprocity. 
But I would just say one thing about this deal, which is it's really part of America's contingency planning for what might happen if there is a war with uh, involving China over Taiwan or, or, or perhaps even northern Philippines or something like this, maybe even in 10 or 12 years time from now. And it's the possibility that the Americans may not be able to count on, on all of their partners and allies in the region. So they're trying to maximize the number that they have. And it's, it's, even though it may be a very good opportunity for Papua New Guinea in the short term, it's possible that the Americans could come calling uh, for, for the full rights in this security partnership deal at some point, you know, 10 years hence, uh, if indeed uh, the situation with China continues to worsen. Samir, Tess and David Humphrey here in the studio. Thank you all. That's all we've time for. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.